Well, we're delighted to have Cosette Kramer with us today. Uh, she's a new faculty member at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Political Science. She's also affiliated with the University of Minnesota Law School. She has a very broad range of research interests. And ordinarily, I know people well enough and are familiar enough with their work to be able to rattle off a good part of it. But Cosette's interests are so broad ranging that I'm going to have to use my notes. Uh, her research spans trade and economic law, international arbitration and dispute resolution, international business transactions, human rights, criminal law and procedure, the laws of war, and comparative policing policies. I think that was the one I was sure I wasn't going to be able to remember. She has both uh, a JD and a PhD from Harvard, obviously the JD from the law school and the PhD from the uh, government department. And it's a great pleasure to have her uh, with us today. She's going to be talking about a subject that uh, interests me enormously, which is the way uh, adjudication happens in the World Trade Organization, which like all international organizations, uh, is very political. Uh, so it's called Between Law and Politics, Judicial Balancing of Trade Authority in the WTO. Cosette, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted um, to be able to present for you today one small part of a broader project that I have that addresses what I really see as a perennial issue um, for scholars, for legal scholars, for political scientists, and for students of public policy as well. And this perennial issue of whether courts, whether courts at any level of governance, take into account extrinsic considerations. So this issue, whether courts take into account these sort of exogenous or extrinsic considerations, um, is hugely salient at the international level, as I'm sure we all know, where we have these really, really intense debates about the independence of third-party decision makers and about, um, and about sort of government control over institutions of global governance. So my talk today, Between Law and Politics, the Judicial Balancing of Trade Authority at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, represents one case study that I have um, that's part of a broader current book project which examines how international judicial bodies, how international courts or quasi-judicial bodies manage these tensions between independence and control and how their management of this tension impacts the allocation of authority between domestic and international levels of governance. So the project asks more broadly, when or under what conditions do we see international judicial or quasi-judicial bodies? When do we see these international courts accommodating national governments? And through this accommodation, allocating greater authority to state or domestic institutions. So by accommodation, I mean when international adjudicators, the judges, the decision makers within their rulings, defer more, provide more deference to a domestic policy or regulatory choice or give a broader margin of appreciation to national government. So if you're familiar with um, sort of the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, this is the language that's often used. When the European Court of Human Rights gives a broader margin of appreciation or accommodates more domestic regulatory or other policy choices. So what I'm going to argue today, um, and in this talk what I'll try to convince you of, is that we can actually identify the conditions under which international courts accommodate or provide greater accommodation to national governments by looking to their dual political and legal environments. So this isn't a new argument that a little bit of law matters, that a little bit of politics matters. Um, what I see as the unique contribution of my project is that I'm trying to specify when and why each matters in a given institutional context, when law matters, when politics matters in a given institutional context, and to also identify ways to actually systematically and empirically evaluate how each matters. So a little, a little bit more detail, specifically I argue that courts that are paying attention to the degree of support that they enjoy in the eyes of their relevant stakeholders. So in the aggregate, I argue that these signals of support for or challenges to an, a court's exercise of its judicial authority represent its political capital. So I call this a court's political capital. In addition, I further argue that court sensitivity to shifts in their underlying inst institutional support or shifts in their underlying political capital really depends in identifiable ways 
on the legal constraints under which these international judges are operating. Um, and as I'll specify later on in the talk, uh, by legal constraints, this legal environment, I'm really referring to relevant and existing case law within an international judicial institution. So to support this argument, um, and so in this talk, I'm going to flesh out this argument in the context of a World Trade Organization, and in doing so, I'm going to draw on a range of evidence, um, both qualitative and quantitative, to try to convince you that this argument is true. Um, and this evidence includes new codings um, of rulings of, the, of an international court, of the sort of the judgments or decisions of an international court, in this context, the adjudicative bodies of the World Trade Organization, um, this evidence also includes automated text or content analysis, measures derived from automated text analysis of government statements made within the, the World Trade Organization, as well as new measures of legal constraints or existing jurisprudence or case law within the World Trade Organization. And I supplement all this evidence with a series, a set of interviews that I conducted with both um, WTO government representatives as well as WTO um, court officials within Geneva. And then I'll conclude this talk um, by highlighting sort of how this, this talk and this part of the project fits in with the larger project, as well as um, some of the implications of my findings and my argument for the institutional design of international courts more generally. Okay, so claims about court behavior, they really fall all along the spectrum spectrum, right, from charges of judicial activism to, to sort of to, to claims or allegations of biased courts pandering to really the most powerful constituents. Current approaches to explaining international court behavior um, fall roughly into three camps. First, some argue um, that powerful, or, so this is kind of a simplification, but some argue um, International relations realist scholars, for in particular, argue that um, economically or politically powerful or dominant countries really are the ones that are controlling these international judicial bodies, whether that control is direct or indirect. So, a number of realist international relations scholars, for example, posit that international institutions, including international judicial bodies or international courts, they're really just tools of the great powers. The great power states are really just using these institutions as tools to achieve what they want. Similarly, there are some legal scholars, um, Eric Posner, John Yu, um, Jack Goldsmith, who argue that sort of most courts really conform their rulings to the preferences of the most influential countries. And so we can't really talk about, because these courts are really just conforming their rulings, their judgments, to what they think the most powerful countries want, what their preferences are. We can't really talk about um, these, these courts as independent judicial bodies in any meaningful sense. So a, a more nuanced version of this court uh, state control argument draws from this really, really rich uh, area of literature derived or developed within the domestic context that adopts this principal agent approach to decision making and to governance. And this principal agent approach to explaining international court behavior um, argues that governments, so the governments are the principles in this relationship, they create courts, the agents in this relationship, and they subject these courts um, through the institutional design of the court, they subject these, these judicial bodies to various forms of formal and structural mechanisms of control. So we can think about sort of judicial selection procedures as being a formal mechanism of control, um, control over a court's budget, right? So financial control as being another um, sort of principal agent mechanism of influence. That being said, there's increasing evidence, at the international level at least, um, that many of these formal or institutional mechanism, mechanisms of control are really, really difficult for states um, to employ in practice. Right? States face collective action problems, they often don't have the same preferences about what they want courts to do, and so they can't really effectively, at, at least, use these um, principal agent mechanisms of influence to control court behavior, at least not fully. Um, and again, this is due to sort of problems of multiple principles, multiple state principles within an international institution having these really divergent preferences. Um, so this renders these mechanisms, judicial selection, salary contraction, etc., um, as relatively ineffective in the context of international courts. 
In other words, um, despite sort of you know the strength of this argument in terms of thinking about the institutional design of courts, governments at the end of the day really don't have perfect control over the international judicial bodies or courts that they create. In contrast, others um, argue that courts, rather than representing agents of the state principles, actually represent trustees, right, rather than agents of member states. And so deriving sort of this idea of, of a trustee from the domestic legal context. Um, and as a trustee, this uh, argument goes, courts really are, are legally independent decision makers um, that sort of sit far removed from the day-to-day -day politics found within international institutions, but still sort of exercising this decision-making authority um, by virtue of sort of the trust endowed in them by the agent member states. Yet, as any scholar of judicial politics, whether at the domestic level or the international level will tell you, judges can be, and often are, incredibly strategic actors. And, the, and as strategic actors, they may be susceptible to all types of external, to various types of external pressures or incentives. I would actually posit that this is particularly the case at the international level, due to the fact that many of these courts are really newly established or weakly institutionalized. And so judges are actually acting potentially more strategically than they might within relatively strongly institutionalized domestic courts. In other words, so sort of the basic takeaway um, point from this approach is that we can't even, we can't really think about courts as, as, international courts in particular, as exercising perfectly independent control. Um, so states don't perfectly control courts, courts aren't um, perfectly independent judicial bodies, and so we need a little bit more to be able to explain where exactly the balance of authority between both sides, between the judicial side and the political side, lands in various cases, right? So, all of these explanations don't really get at where the authority might land um, in a given instance. So my argument, and what I'm going to try to convince you of today, is that due to the unavailability or ineffectiveness of many of these formal mechanisms of control, that governments, governments have you know, caught on to this, right? Governments that have created this interna these international courts realize they can't actually perfectly control the behavior of these courts through election procedures, through budget, etc., they've caught on to this and instead now rely primarily on really more diffuse informal mechanisms to attempt to influence um, court behavior. So these diffuse informal mechanisms, um, I would argue, refer to these rhetorical challenges that governments make to um, these rhetorical challenges that they make to, or, or, ex or sort of expressions of support they give for a court's exercise of authority. In the aggregate, these communicative pressures or signals, these rhetorical pressures or signals, constitute what I call a court's political capital. And furthermore, adjudicators, the courts, the, the sort of judicial decision makers sitting on these courts are sensitive to shifts, to changes um, in, the, in their underlying political capital. That is, they're savvy and strategic actors that sometimes take these rhetorical signals into account when they're issuing their rulings. That is, they're sensitive and sometimes responsive to shifts in their underlying political capital. Um, and to, to sort of recap, I refer to the political capital of an international court. It's a term I use to refer to the overall level of support that's expressed by a court's primary constituents. And so in many cases for international courts, uh, the judicial body's primary or relevant stakeholders or constituents are going to be the member states. There will be other constituents in, other, in, in, in various types of courts, um, but for the most part, member states are really the primary constituents, particularly in the context of the World Trade Organization. So courts are sensitive to shifts in their underlying, um, in, in the overall level of support that's expressed by their constituents. But I argue further, that their responsiveness to these rhetorical pressures, their responsiveness and sensitivity to these shifts in their underlying political capital is moderated by legal constraints in really patterned ways relating to existing case law. So I'm gonna develop this argument further uh, within the context of the World Trade Organization, but before I do so, I wanna give you a little bit of sort of institutional background or context on the World Trade Organization's judicial bodies. 
um, which is called the Dispute Settlement Mechanism. So if you hear me say DSM, or Dispute Settlement Mechanism, that refers to the judicial bodies of the world, or the adjudicative bodies of the World Trade Organization. So the Dispute Settlement Mechanism was established by a multilateral treaty um, at the end of the Uruguay Rounds in 1994 and 1995. Um, and the Dispute Settlement Mechanism of the WTO is widely seen, by scholars at least, um, and by a number of government officials, as one of the, one of the strongest, most effective, um, and highly judicialized and inter independent interstate dispute settlement mechanism that exists today. And so for these reasons, I would posit that um, the, the WTO actually represents a hard case for my argument about the influence of more informal um, political pressures because it is so highly judicialized um, and independent. Does anything come even close? To the World Trade Organization? Well, if, you think, yeah. if you think of the, of the constellation of international adjudication, can you think of anything that comes close? Um, so it depends on the type of adjudication. If we're just talking about institutions that exist to settle disputes between states, Right, which is what the WTO does. It only settles trade disputes between two governments or two states. Um, I mean, the, the European Court of Justice could come close, even though it's really not set up to be just solely a dispute settlement mechanism. Um, it's really sort of more of a, almost a constitutional court in a, in a certain sense, especially because challenges can be brought against state policies from the European Commission, for example. Um, but in terms of enforcement powers, because sort of it the European Court of Justice effectively can dictate to domestic courts to, to enforce their decisions. Um, it has pretty strong enforcement powers um, and, is, and is relatively independent of member states. I would say that... And that's embedded, though, in, an, in, in, a, a, in a broader a regime, system, yeah. yeah. I would say, like, in terms of dispute settlement between private actors and states, I mean, investment investor state dispute settlement um, has pretty strong teeth, right? If we're thinking about enforcement powers... More this is much more elaborate, and it's just, it's more judicialized. Like right. it, in, investor state dispute settlement, it's very ad hoc. Um, there's uh, it's very ad hoc. Um, there's a lot of arguments about potentially sort of you know into commingling or, or bias within the arbitrators themselves. Yeah. Um, so in terms of independence of, of the adjudicators, this is much more strongly judicialized in that respect. Yeah. So it's really on its own, and as you say, it's it's. You're picking a particular a particular case with a particular level of, of independence. I mean, yes. Yeah, and well, I'll talk a little bit about how these adjudicators are selected, right. particularly at the first order level. Um, but it, it it's a two tier sort of judicial system. There's an appellate body, um, and you know there's been some scholarship on sort of the independence mm -hmm. of the WTO appellate body members. The the, the judges who are picked for the, the, the second tier level of it, um, which I'm not going to be talking about today. Um, but for the most part, it's difficult for one country to, to control that. That's actually, that's not true. <laughs> the, there's veto power, right? So I, I know of a number of individuals who are candidates to be elected as members of the appellate body of the WTO, who effectively the US vetoed their, their candidacy. Um, so there's influence in that way, but it still goes back to my original point that you know you have collective action problems in the WTO because it's it's you know it's 140 something members. Um, there are a lot of states involved. It's consensus decision making, right? So they have to elect these individuals by consensus for the most part, um, and so it's really hard for them to for for any one state to control the outcome in terms of judicial selection. So there is a great deal of independence there. Um, in terms of how the WTO appellate body members see their role as well, if you talk to, to former appellate body members, um, they view themselves as very independent and far removed from the political sort of day-to-day -day of the WTO. So for me, this represents a hard case. If we're talking about informal political pressures, this is where we'd expect to see it the least potentially. Um, so it's a hard case for my argument. So dispute settlement in the WTO, um, it begins when one country challenges a trade regulation or trade policy of another government as somehow violating WTO rules. So for example, five, or must be six years ago now, Indonesia um, challenged a provision in the 2009, the US's uh, 2009 Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act, or the Tobacco Control Act. So this act banned the purchase or sale of flavored cigarettes, um, including clove cigarettes within the United States, 
Uh, but this act also made an exception for menthol produce menthol flavored cigarettes. Um, and the reason behind this, you know, there's very strong domestic you know, lobbying pressure on Congress, right, not to, to prohibit the manufacturing or sale of menthol cigarettes because um, there are a number of domestic uh, tobacco companies that produce and sell uh, menthol cigarettes. In the U United States at this point in time, at least, clove cigarettes were predominantly and primarily imported from Indonesia. So we were actually receiving the majority of our, the clove cigarettes that were sold in the United States from Indonesia. Um, and this represented hundreds of millions of dollars of annual revenue for the Southeast Asian nation. So Indonesia then launched a challenge uh, under the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement within the WTO. And the TBT, or Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, really aims to ensure that any technical regulation that's put in place domestically is not trade discriminatory. It doesn't sort of create unnecessary obstacles to trade. So Indonesia challenged the Tobacco Control Act under the TBT agreement of the WTO as being as violating the TBT and being restrictive, um, trade restrictive in a discriminatory fashion. So in this case, what happens is, is Indonesia challenges this. Um, they, there's a set period of time within which Indonesia and the United States um, engage in confidential negotiations to try to resolve this dispute, to try to somehow um, reach a mutually uh, agreed upon solution. In this case, the dispute couldn't be resolved through these confidential negotiations within the set, the set period of time that's stipulated within WTO rules. Um, and this is particularly the case because the Tobacco Control Act actually represented and involved a really critical, at that point in time, uh, national youth anti-smoking campaign um, that a number of actors within the United States were getting behind. Um, in the United States. And so the act itself was actually this product of balancing of a number of competing domestic regulatory interests and priorities. Um, and so no, no negotiation, no resolution through negotiations could be reached in this case. So under WTO procedures, Indonesia then requested that this dispute, this, its challenge, be adjudicated by what's called a dispute panel. So a dispute panel is technically a quasi-judicial body. It's somewhat analogous to a court and that its rulings are legally binding on the disputing party. So anything that the panel rules on is binding on the parties to that dispute. A dispute panel is composed of three individuals, three uh, panelists, as they're called. And these individuals are appointed ad hoc. Right? They're appointed for that dispute only. And they're appointed either by the disputing parties. The disputing parties have to agree on who they select as panelists. Or they're appointed by the director general of the WTO. So in this case, uh, in the case of Indonesia and the United States, Indonesia and the United States actually agreed um, and jointly appointed the three panelists that they selected. But the majority of disputes that are heard by the World Trade Organization, um, the majority of panelists um, that have heard disputes within the World Trade Organization have actually been selected by the Director General of the WTO. So even the parties aren't really selecting who's adjudicating their disputes. It's the WTO Director General. So I, I, what's the, I, don't, I should know this, but I don't. Uh, what's the determining factor of who decides? Um, Do they so there's meet, a set period of time. Just, they, if, they don't, if people don't come forward with preferences, uh, is that the way No, so they actually have to, to agree on three together. So right. in the case of investor state dispute settlement, one party selects one panelist, right. the other right. party right. selects right. another panelist, and those two panelists select the third. In the case of the WTO, they actually have to agree on the three that they're going to, to select. Um, they just have to sort of both agree on the same person and they, they, negotiate, they do that through negotiation. But you said that the director general... Uh, right, so they have a set period of time, right? So there are very strict time limits to dispute settlements. You can't actually ever really just delay dispute settlement because there are very, very strict time limits and very strict consequences if you don't meet those time limits within the dispute settlement um, procedures. And so if they can't come to an agreement, if they just can't agree right, on the three panelists, then it goes to the director general to decide on the three. In consultation, uh, it's been a he so far. In consultation with the parties to the dispute, in consultation with the, the WTO secretariat. Um, but the vast majority of panelists have actually been selected by the WTO director general. Sometimes it's just that the parties they don't want to like negotiate or talk about who to select. Just leave it up to the director general. Um, and I actually, you know, through my, my interviews, I haven't heard a lot of um, unhappiness or dissatisfaction with the panelists that the director general um, appoints. 
and we can talk about this a little bit more, but there are actually a number of repeat panelists. So um, there's a list that they can select from, but they often select from outside that list. And uh, there are some individuals who have sat on, you know, seven to ten panels. But they're all international trade lawyers, are they? No, not necessarily. Um, so these panels are appointed ad hoc, um, and they have full-time jobs. They have full-time jobs. This is something they're doing, you know, part-time. Um, and a majority of the panelists that have been selected for dispute panels so far are actually concurrent or previous government representatives within the World Trade Organization. So a number of these panelists, I mean, they're actually diplomats, right? They might have trade law backgrounds, but the vast majority are government delegates to the WTO. Um, so they, they might be individuals who are sitting, right, with other government representatives in, in different committees within the WTO, right, within sort of the Trade Environment Committee, for example, or the Technical Barriers to Trade Committee, in the morning and in the afternoon, right, actually hearing the arguments from these government um, representatives. So the vast majority of them are representing their governments within the WTO. They're, they could be lawyers. Um, there are num a number of uh, delegations within Geneva have a number of trade lawyers on board, um, but they could just be diplomats. There are some who are drawn from academia. I mean, it's, it's diverse. I actually went through and sort of coded all their CVs for all of their background. Um, some, come, some have background experience as WTO secretariat officials. Um, some have really extensive experience within domestic national trade um, ministries, for example. Some are strictly academics. Um, but that's actually very few. Most of them are actually government representatives or ha were at one point in time government representatives within the WTO. And that kind of makes sense. You sort of, you build up a network, right? It's a very, you get to know the people <laughs> that are sitting within this beautiful building in Geneva, and um, you build up a reputation for being somebody who is sort of trade savvy or fair, um, and so governments trust you more, potentially, and for that reason might, might select you as a, as a dispute panelist. Yeah, but so in the case of um, the dispute between Indonesia and the United States, um, in that clove cigarettes dispute, two of the three panels selected had or were working as their country's representatives within the WTO um, at the time of the dispute, while the third was an academic who had also previously worked um, as his country's director for trade policies review, um, and then had also previously worked within the WTO secretariat, so as a WTO official. Um, so there's a broad mix, but for the most part, there they are oftentimes sitting concurrently um, as their, their government's representative within the WTO. So the dispute panels are considered the court of first instance within the WTO. So either party, after they issue their ruling, they hear arguments on both sides, they read the legal briefs, they can ask questions to the parties, um, they can hear from third parties as well. Um, and after this happens, they issue a ruling deciding which aspect of the trade measure or policy being challenged violates WTO rules. And following this ruling, either party can appeal issues of law or legal interpretation contained within the panel ruling to the court of second instance in the WTO. And in the Club Cigarettes case, only the US appealed part of the decision, Indonesia didn't appeal any of it. Um, so <coughs> the appellate body is the sort of court of second instance, the appeals body within the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. And so although appellate body rulings aren't binding on anyone beyond that dispute, so unlike in domestic legal systems, in, in the US legal system, for example, there's no rule of stare decisis, there's no rule of binding precedent within WTO law, um, there's been a number of studies that have demonstrated that there's a de facto form of precedent that operates within the World Trade Organization. At the very least, um, panel rulings often cite to relevant appellate body case law. So um, it's, it, although they're not legally technically bound to follow appellate body case law and other disputes, they can and often do cite to those rulings um, and, so, and, and follow them. And so in that way, uh, this de facto form of precedent is said to exist. And so panelists are really sort of paying attention, or at least in theory paying attention to, and trying to follow what the appellate body has said in previous cases. So panels are assisted in their task um, because you know this isn't their full time job. They have they have full time jobs. This is something they're doing on the side. Um, they're assisted in their task by 
individuals from the, legal, the WTO Legal Affairs Secretariat. So the Legal Affairs Division of the, of the WTO Secretariat, um, these are WTO officials, they're not government representatives, they work on behalf of the WTO, and they provide really critical support in relation to these disputes, in relation to doing a lot of the legal research, and even drafting of a number of these panel rulings or panel reports. Um, are the proceedings open to the rest of the members of the World Trade Organization, or are they closed? just between the two parties? No, so they're open, they're definitely open to the third party members. And others, other states can sit in, right, and watch, but in terms of actually participating and arguing, only third party members, uh, governments who have basically in registered um, their intention to act as third parties within the dispute, only these third party members can participate in a more active way in terms of submitting arguments to, to the, the panel. Um, and I won't talk about it today, but increasingly the appellate body and dispute panels have also started to accept written submissions from amicus um, parties as well. So from civil society organizations, these amicus briefs, it's actually caused a lot of controversy within the World Trade Organization whether this should happen, whether the dispute settlement mechanism should be accepting amicus briefs from you know, NGOs or, or, or other sort of non-third third, uh, party members to the dispute, um, but for the most part, they have been accepting. Whether or not they take them into account is a different question, but they've been accepting these amicus briefs as well. Though um, civil society organizations, et cetera, can actually participate in, in the actual, the physical dispute. So panelists, um, during this, uh, during the oral argument side of it at least, ask questions of the disputing parties to clarify um, arguments or facts contained within their, um, their arguments, their written pleadings, they can call experts. So if it's a really sort of fact or, or really a technically intensive dispute, um, they'll often call economists in or individuals who have expertise, for example, in, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So there's a lot of um, uh, sanitary, sanitary and phytosanitary um, agreement cases that involve sort of, you know, whether or not, yeah, you know, whether or not some sort of pesticides has a negative impact or sort of the harm that the hormones within beef actually causes. And so they'll have sci scientific experts come in and give testimony sometimes as well. But they can ask questions of the parties as well. Um, and anecdotally, um, a number of, of secretary officials as well as government representatives will often comment on sort of the quality of some of these panelists' questioning, questions and, and lines of questioning, um, indicating that it's often evident, for some panelists at least, that they don't know what they're actually asking. <laughs> and that these questions have effectively been fed to them by the legal affairs Secretariat, that the legal affairs is secretary because they're doing all the legal research for them, they're doing a lot of the drafting for them, and oftentimes they'll even write the questions that the panelists will then pose to the parties, but not really understanding what, what they're asking. This is anecdotally, I'm not saying everybody does this. Now one of the big differences between the GATT and the WTO is the much bigger infrastructure. Yeah. How large is the legal affairs secretary? Oof. I have this number, I don't well, have I mean, it off the top of my head, but it's not that large. I think it, it's like 15 to 18 individuals right now. So the Secretariat is a little bit larger, right, because there is the Rules Division, there's other divisions of the Secretariat, but the Legal Affairs Secretariat, and we'll talk a little bit more about individuals within them, because there have been some effectively career officials, right, individuals who have been in the Legal Affairs Secretariat almost since its inception. Um, and it started out really small, I think around like four to eight, and now it might be around 15 to 18. And that's roughly, um, I would have to double, double yes. check to give exact numbers, but it's not huge, yeah, right? right. Um, and this isn't the only thing that they're doing. So the role of the legal affairs secretary within the WTO, I mean, is, is manifold. They're helping the panelists on the one hand, but they're also assisting, um, they're basically, they're there to assist government representatives. And, all sort of aspects that relate to, to WTO legal issues. Um, so they also attend um, meetings of the dispute settlement body. So this is a political body within the World Trade Organization, the DSP or dispute settlement body. Um, it's made up of every single member of the WTO, 
and like the general counsel of the WTO, like a number of the committees, it's made up of every single member of the WTO. And it meets about once a month. And the role of this political body is to oversee and to manage the dispute settlement system within the WTO. Um, so, as I said, this body's made up of every single member. Not every single member shows up for every monthly meeting, especially the, the members' states that have smaller delegations within Geneva. Um, one of its responsibilities is to adopt the rulings of the panel and the appellate body. So, in contrast to the GATT, um, these rulings are automatically adopted by the dispute settlement body unless they all agree not to adopt it. So, under the GATT, any one individual member could veto, basically say, we're not adopting, this This ruling isn't legally binding. Including they reversed notably the defendants. Right, exactly, including notably the losers right. of the dispute. Right. Um, in, in the WTO, this is reversed, and they can still re refuse to adopt the ruling, but every single member has to, has to agree to not adopt it, to basically veto this ruling. So that's one of, one of its responsibilities. Um, and in relation to sort of managing any aspect of the DSB, governments and the repre government representatives in the dispute settlement body often sort of stand up and they make these statements about specific disputes or about the dispute settlement mechanism, about the appellate body and the dispute panel, how they're exercising their authority. There are a lot of statements surrounding when they started accepting amicus briefs. When they're adopting these reports, right, they're put up for adoption, these rulings, and any government can make a statement about what happened within that ruling, right? The, the reasoning of the panel, the reasoning of the legal reasoning of the appellate body, the potential implications or, or sort of economic or legal consequences of the ruling, things about procedural aspects, transparency of the dispute settlement process. Um, and this happens. Government officials do can and often do stand up and make statements publicly on the record, right? The minutes of these statements, uh, the minutes of these meetings are made public to the world. Uh, as they can and often do make these statements on the record about how the dispute panels and the appellate body are exercising their authority. And one of the jobs of the Legal Affairs Secretariat is there's an individual from, an official from the Legal Affairs Secretariat who sits in on every single meeting of the dispute settlement body. And they sit there and they're actually transcribing the minutes. They're listening to all the statements, they're transcribing the minutes, um, and they're answering any questions that any representative has about about any legal or other issue that arises about specific disputes or about the dispute settlement mechanism more generally. So they attend every meeting, the secretariat officials are attending every DSB meeting, they're helping to transcribe these statements, they're listening, um, and they're also there to assist members. So I actually argue that, um, but simultaneously to doing this, right, so they're there answering questions of any member relating to the dispute settlement process, relating to any legal issues that they have, as well as simultaneously assisting the dispute panelists in adjudicating trade disputes that, are, that come up before them. So they're assisting these panels in hearing and ruling on the disputes. And so I argue that in this way, sort of the institutional structure of the WTO with this dual role that the Legal Affairs Secretary plays actually facilitates the aggregation, the assimilation, and then the transmittal of the views being expressed within the political body by the members of the DSB to the dispute panelists, right, via the Legal Affairs Secretary, because they're sitting there in every meeting, they're transcribing the minutes, they know what's being said. And this institutional structure, this dual role of the Legal Affairs Secretary, actually allows them to transmit these signals, these communicative sort of signals about how the appellate body and dispute panels are exercising their authority back to the panelists when they're assisting them in adjudicating disputes. So given this institutional context, um, my argument or, or sort of this case study within this book project asks when we see the first order dispute panels, WTO dispute panels, accommodating national governments. When do we see, what are the conditions under which we would expect them or do we see them accommodating national governments and taking into account sort of these rhetorical pressures or signals? Um, so my argument proceeds in a number of steps. Um, first, I argue that, or sort of I posit that governments are, they're actually using these statements within the political body of the dispute settlement body, the DSB, to signal when they're satisfied with the exercise of authority by the dispute settlement mechanism and when they're dissatisfied with it. 
So they're actually using these statements on the record that are public to signal support for or challenges to the DSM's exercise of authority. So this step of my argument was, um, was actually relatively widely supported within uh, interviews that I conducted with a representative sample of WTO member state delegates within Geneva. So one government representative um, noted that despite what the black letter lawyers think, right, despite what the black letter lawyers think, this is a, this is a, just a completely legal body, judicially independent legal body, there's a political organization here. That member control is already happening within DSB meetings through these statements that government representatives are making. Another government representative um, indicated that these statements, these statements made on the record of the dispute settlement body, are really a way to send to them, them in this context being the appellate body, the legal affairs secretariat, and the panels, to send to the D dispute settlement mechanism a concrete message. And that that's the right way to send the message. So what this means is, don't go sort of ex parte, right, and try right. to, to, to right. sort of, to yeah, right, right. try right. to influence right. influence the secretary, to influence the panelists. The right way to do it is through sort of the way in which the WTO's institutional um, structure is set up to facilitate this. This is the right way to send them a message. Yeah, so the second step of my argument is that not only are governments using these statements to signal their support for challenges to the DSM's exercise of authority, but the DSM and the pan dispute panelists and the secretary in particular, they're paying attention to these signals. They're listening to these statements. They're paying attention to what's being said within the dispute settlement body. So this step of my argument was also supported within um, a set of interviews that I conducted with WTO secretariat officials, as well as a number of former panelists, um, individuals who had formerly sat on dispute panels. One secretariat official indicated that there is a message within these statements, and that depending on how important or sensitive the issue is, the DSM will take it into account. So these secretariat officials are completely cognizant of the fact that some of these statements made on the record are just posturing, right? political posturing on the part of government representatives. But depending on how important the issue is, depending on how sensitive it is, that not only are they listening, but sometimes they will take these signals into account. Another secretariat, legal affairs division secretariat official, um, and somebody who'd actually been a formal panelist a number of times, indicated that these secretariat officials, they are sitting in the room. I mean, that's, that's sort of common knowledge. They are sitting in the room. They have to be to transcribe. Um, but not only from the legal affairs secretariat, but from the appellate body secretariat as well, even though that's not sort of the focus of, of this talk. These secretariat officials, they're sitting in the room. And the brain is taking it in, but regardless of, of what happens, they're listening. Um, and, and that means that the panelists and the appellate body members are also listening to these signals that are being made within the dispute settlement body. So given this, um, as strategic political actors, I would argue that panelists are sensitive to shifts in their political capital. They're sensitive to, the, to changes in these rhetorical signals or pressures. And they seek to maximize their political capital. They seek to maximize the institutional support they have among the membership whenever it's possible to do so. Um, so to sort of just refresh, political capital is this term that I used to refer to the overall level or degree of institutional support that's expressed or signaled by a court's primary constituents. As strategic legal actors, However, um, the panelists are also seeking to avoid having their judgments reversed by the appellate body. So even if a panel, so not only are they seeking to sort of maximize the institutional support by the membership as a whole, but they're also, they don't want to be knocked down by the appellate body, right? They don't want to have their ruling or their decision reversed um, for reputational reasons. There are a number of sort of, sort of individual um, sort of motivations that we can talk about that might motivate panelists, panelists to do this. But even if they're not motivated by trying to maximize political capital at the same time as avoiding having the rulings reversed by the appellate body, the even if they're just lazy, even if they just don't care, right? The secretariat really is there um, to step in and to sort of, to even if, so even if a panelist isn't independently <coughs> motivated to do this, the secretariat provides for these lazy panelists a really low-cost way for them to engage in, in effectively risk-averse behavior, right? Maximize political support, but also sort of avoid ruling reversal. And the secretariat is motivated to do this 
right, to, to ensure that panel, panel rulings are taking into account both of these factors because they want, they want two things, right? They want to ensure that any ruling that the DSM issues is complied with, right? They want government compliance with these rulings. And one way to do that is to ensure that whatever the ruling is, is maximizing support among the membership as a whole. Right? Why do they want to seek to secure compliance? Because compliance with these rulings are really a measure for them at least, um, and this came out in a number of interviews, it's a measure of them of the strength of the WTO. Right? If all of a sudden every single country that lost wasn't complying with the ruling, that would really indicate the weakness of the dispute settlement system for the legal, for the secretariat officials. And they don't want that. They want to ensure the continuing strength of the WTO's dispute settlement system. They also want to ensure predictability, and so one way in which to sort of strengthen the WTO's dispute settlement system is to ensure that there's a relative, a fair amount of legal consistency and predictability. And one way to do that is to make sure that whatever the panel is ruling is in line with appellate body jurisprudence. So they, the Secretariat is really trying to also avoid rulings, panel rulings or decisions, um, that they think or that they suspect the appellate body will smack down on appeal. So in sum, the Secretariat plays this really key aggregative role in my argument um, in transmitting to panelists both the existing case law that's out there in terms of what the appellate body has ruled, as well as the degree of institutional support that's presently voiced within the dispute settlement body. So panels are trying to maximize this political capital, whether it's the individual panelists or the Secretariat officials, to the extent possible within the legal constraints um, within which they're operating. So given these motivations and micro foundations, I argue that we can actually expect to see panels providing governments more greater accommodation within their rulings um, and to, to try to seek to maximize this political capital or they'll give more accommodation when their degree of institutional support declines, right? When they see a, a sort of a decrease in the amount of political capital that the dispute settlement mechanism has. <coughs> so if, if they are sensitive and responsive to these political pressures, we should see something within their panel rulings. We should see more deference being given to national governments to really signal to concerned governments, to assuage concerned governments, that the, that the, the dispute settlement mechanism is taking into account their concerns. Signal to the membership as a whole that the DSM is taking it into account their concerns to try to further increase or maximize um, their political capital to the level of the degree of institutional support that they enjoy. So how do I like, capture this idea of political capital and institutional support? So, all right, so first of all, what is my outcome variable of interest? What are we talking about when we talk about accommodation? So to measure this, I basically took every single panel ruling that was issued between 1996 and 2003, and I assigned it a panel validation score. So I basically went through each ruling and coded each discrete finding or decision within that ruling for whether or not it upheld or smacked down a specific aspect of the trade regulation. Right? So these rulings isn't just trade discriminatory, not trade discriminatory. They actually, these rulings oftentimes make a number of very discrete findings about different aspects of a trade regulation or policy. They'll say, okay, that one is conforms to WTO rules, that aspect of the, of the law conforms to WTO rules, that aspect doesn't. So there are often um, a number of discrete findings that, panel ruling, that panels make within these rulings. Um, and so I went through each panel report and coded it on a scale from, one to, from zero to one uh, for the degree of validation or accommodation that the rulings provided. So it's a continuous variable ranging from zero to one, with zero being absolutely no accommodation. So they struck down every single aspect of the trade policy being challenged to one, where they upheld every single aspect of the trade policy or regulation being challenged, a complete win for the, the, for the defendant. Um, so a little less than two-thirds, the vast majority of rulings are mixed, right? The vast majority, to a, a little, around two-thirds of the rulings are not complete losses or complete wins for either side, right? So they have, their, panels have a little bit of sort of room to maneuver in terms of what they find violates WTO law, um, and what they uphold and validate and sort of say, okay, this is okay, you have regulatory authority over this, this area, you're fine in terms of WTO law. 
So to illustrate this a little bit more, in the context of the um, U.S. and Indonesia trade dispute, in this case, I mean, there were, there were nine total findings that were made in this dispute. Um, two, I think, really, really illustrate what validation means. So um, the Tobacco Control Act was found to be in violation of art or breach of Article 2.1 of the uh, Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, and then it gave much more favorable treatment to domestic menthol cigarettes, right, than it did to foreign and imported, to very much like imported flavored or clove cigarettes. In contrast, um, the panel also found that the Tobacco Control Act did not violate, so was not in breach of, so it, it, it validated that aspect of the Tobacco Control Act, Article 2.2 of the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement. Because the Tobacco Control Act was not more trade restrictive than necessary to fulfill this legitimate objective um, of sort of reducing youth smoking and protecting um, the health of youth within the United States. This uh, second finding, this latter finding in particular, was really seen by, by a vast number of commentators as, as signaling really significant deference on the part of the WTO's judicial bodies to domestic health priorities. So a number of commentators said, okay, this is the panel basically saying, signaling, okay, we're deferring to you, we're accommodating your domestic health priorities and your regulatory control and over they've done that, that. On, on environmental issues. They've done that on environmental issues, even though, you know, in the Brazil retreaded tire case, they said, okay, Brazil, you can't restrict imports of these retreaded tires, but on the, on the other hand, I mean, you can, but you have to be equally discriminatory, right? Um, we actually want you to go further, and you can have control, um, sort of, have regulatory authority over and over sort of protecting environment and health within um, your country. So in this case, five out of the nine total findings um, found no breach or validated or upheld or accommodated um, domestic law, so found no breach of WTO rules, so resulting in a panel validation score for this particular dispute of 0.5, a bit more than 0.5. So in terms of political capital, right, the institutional support um, <laughs> that the dispute settlement mechanism enjoys, what I did was I went through um, I went through all individual dispute settlement body statements made by government representatives within these meetings between 1995 and 2013. Um, and I employed, a, I then used a form of automated non-parametric content analysis, I'm happy to talk about the methods of that. In further detail, if you'd like, I use this to, to basically to classify these statements according to a pre-specified coding scheme. And there are four categories within this coding scheme. Those statements that were critical of the WTO's exercise of adjudicative authority, those that were supportive of the WTO's exercise of judicial authority, those that were neutral towards the WTO's judicial bodies, so didn't express either support or criticism within the language, or those that were unrelated to the dispute settlement mechanism. So there's a lot about um, governments making statements about other governments not complying that don't really have to do with the judicial bodies per se. So I coded all of those statements out and didn't include them within my estimates of the percentage of total statements made in a given half year that were either critical of um, the WTO's judicial body or supportive of its exercise of authority. So the important thing to note, and this sort of this represents the, the proportion of total statements made within a given half year within the DSB that were critical, and that's the solid line here on the bottom, as well as supportive of the WTO's um, exercise, judicial body's exercise of authority. And the important thing to note here is that, that the political capital, if, if this represents the political capital of the dispute settlement mechanism, it changes, right? It's not constant, it changes in pattern ways over time, and it actually varies quite a bit. There's a noticeable shift um, in 2005 in particular, right, where you see, you know, it used to be that sort of, the, it was relatively equal in terms of the proportion of statements that were supportive and critical. In 2005, you see this really distinct, interesting sort of shift in the way that governments are engaging with the dispute settlement mechanism, the dispute settlement system. And my, you know, in other work, I've, I've sort of looked at, at what, what's driving this shift. Um, and it's really, I think, a growing frustration um, from a number of states, uh, developing countries and, and countries that don't participate actually a lot in the dispute settlement mechanism, um, a, a really growing frustration with the with the inability of the dispute settlement system to address what 
a number of government representatives see as really broader um, and somewhat systemic disparities between groups of countries. In any event, I expect during sort of when we see these upticks, right, when we see these periods of greater, um, greater criticism of the exercise of authority by the judicial bodies, um, that we should observe an increase in the amount of accommodation that panels are giving, or we should see higher validation scores following. Panelists are saying, okay, look, wow, countries are getting really, really, they're really expressing a lot of dissatisfaction with how we're exercising our authority. We need to assuage them a little bit. We need to give them a little bit more deference. But I also expect that, um, that in terms of legal constraints, that when a panel is ruling on an issue for which there's relatively more appellate body case law, when they have more guidance coming from the appellate body, that the secretariat is going to push the panelists to look not only to what governments are saying, but to also look to the appellate body for guidance. Um, conversely, when we see less dense case law, so when we see um, issues arising under agreements that aren't really heavily litigated within the WTO, uh, we should see panels looking more towards the states, right, for guidance in terms of how they should be exercising their authority and how much judicial restraint or accommodation they should be exercising. So to measure, um, so in this way, legal constraints, they really, I see them as a moderating factor that's moderating the influence of political capital and accommodation. When legal constraints are high, when there's a lot of existing relevant case law, um, it sort of, it more heavily moderates the influence of, of political capital. We should see political capital mattering less. When there's relatively less case law, when case law is, um, there are relatively fewer legal constraints, political capital should matter more. So I don't really want to get into this too much, but how I measured legal constraints um, was basically I coded for each of the individual issues that was decided by a panel, uh, the cumulative sum of existing appellate body case law. And then I normalized this by the number of issues on which the panel ruled. Um, so in sum, what this captures really, uh, it's not simply a count of pre-existing case law, so it's not sort of just a sum of existing appellate body case law but it takes into account the substantive scope of the panel's ruling as well. <coughs> so then to sort of evaluate this, because I'm primarily interested in the moderating influence of uh, the legal constraints on political capital, I interacted with in-standard ordinary least squares regression analyses, um, estimates of critical statements, the sort of the proportion of statements that are critical within a given half year. I interacted that with um, the appellate body case law score for a, given, for a given dispute. And I emphasize the moderating influence of critical statements as opposed to supportive ones, because within interviews with um, WTO officials, they suggest that they're actually they're paying much more attention to these critical statements than they are to, to statements exercising support. That being said, within the, the model, I also include the estimates of supportive statements as well. And then finally, I include a broad set of covariates within the model that the literature suggests or that I believe could act as confounders in this case. So the identity of the parties to the dispute, um, how powerful they are, how large their economies are, a number of uh, sort of characteristics of the trade law or policy or measure being challenged, um, the issue area, so there are some agreements that are incredibly politically sensitive, particularly those surrounding um, agriculture and textiles, um, intellectual property. Um, and then I also include a number of covariates that account for the characteristics of the panelists themselves, right? Whether or not they're government officials or sort of independent in some way, or and the number of cases that they sat on, whether they're repeat panelists. And in sum, I find that, uh, that, the cri that criticism, criticism of the WTO's exercise of authority, is really consistently and positively associated with a higher validation score. So in other words, panels do really seem to be taking into account and seem to be providing governments with greater accommodation when the membership as a whole, not just individual states, but the membership as a whole, is relatively more critical of the DSM's exercise of authority. So this is a marginal effects plot that displays the relationship between criticism and a report's validation score, or, right? And this is the solid line here on the x-axis, the relationship, the marginal effect of criticism on a report's validation score at various levels of appellate body case law, or various levels of legal constraints along the x-axis here. So it shows that the influence um, of relatively more critical statements, 
on accommodation is decreasing as legal constraints, as, as appellate body case law becomes more dense. So in this way, the appellate body case law, the legal constraints, is really moderating sort of the dampening effect that um, criticism has on, um, on not exercising judicial restraint. So the impact of criticism on validation is significant up until around right here where the confidence intervals drop below zero. Um, and this actually includes around 75%, right? So this, when, when the impact of criticism on accommodation matters or is found to be significant within the model, accounts for about 75% of panel rulings that have been issued to date. So the vast majority of panel rulings fall within this degree of legal constraints. This finding does suggest, however, that for, um, for frequently litigated provisions, right, so for areas, for issue areas in which there's a lot of disputes coming up, right, there's a lot of disputes arising as appellate body case law accumulates around these issue areas, right, that we should actually see panels beginning to pay less attention to what's being expressed within the dispute settlement body, paying less attention to negative shifts in their political capital when issuing rulings on these really frequently litigated provisions. So I began this talk by asking when do we see dispute panels, WTO dispute panels, signaling accommodation to national governments. And I argued that sort of, that we see this happening, um, and, we, and I drew on a range of evidence to try to convince you that this happens, um, that we can specify when panels will signal accommodation by looking to really the shifts in their political capital, really increases in criticism that's coming from the membership as a whole, specifically in the form of sort of these aggregative, aggregate or collective government challenges to the DSM's exercise of authority. But the panel responsiveness to these shifts in their political capital is moderated by existing case law in really patterned ways. So these findings suggest a number of things. Um, one, I think they suggest that the DSM and panels in particular, they're really effectively using their rulings on issues with much less appellate body case law to provide governments with greater flexibility through this greater accommodation. So in this way, panels might actually be helping to address a primary institutional design concern um, and that is how to balance greater legalism within the trade regime, right, with the continued adaptability and flexibility of, of the trade regime over time. I think my findings also suggest that uh, we should be paying much more attention to the design of the secretari of secretariats and registrars um, within international judicial bodies and the mechanisms through which international courts obtain information about government's views. So in this talk, I painted a pretty rosy picture about the role of the WTO secretariat um, and it's sort of its ability to effectively fulfill its role. Um, but I would suggest that um, in a number of other international judicial bodies, and there's anecdotal evidence about this, that the secretariat and the registrar actually play a much more nefarious gatekeeping role. Um, and so we should be paying a lot more attention to how we're designing their role and their responsibilities and sort of accountability checks on registries and secretariats within international judicial bodies. I have another large project right now that's actually looking at the role of secretariats or legal registries within international courts in building trust between, between members of the regime and between parties to a dispute. <laughs> Finally, sort of the big elephant in the room, the big so what question, does this matter, right? At the end of the day, does this matter? Does great accommodation matter if a government is still losing on some parts of, its, of a case? Um, in other research, I've looked at whether the degree of accommodation, how much validation a panel is giving matters, whether sort of the degree of accommodation within a ruling, that spoonful of sugar, right, to help the medicine of, acting, of enacting sometimes really controversial trade policy reforms um, go down, whether that matters. And I found that actually greater accommodation within these panel rulings, within appellate body rulings as well, is associated with both the greater probability of the dispute being settled and resolved within the WTO, um, as well as faster implementation of or compliance with the ruling. Oops, sorry, I don't know how that happened. Get rid of this. Let's do this. Um, so I found in, in, um, in, in this other research that greater accommodation matters for both the settlement of the dispute and how quickly it gets complied with, but that it's really conditional on the type of trade measure that's being challenged. 
that validation, this type of accommodation, this signaling by the panels really only matters when to come into compliance with the WTO ruling, the country has to enact legislative reforms. So a lot of these rulings can be complied with through changing an administrative regulation. It can go directly through the executive branch. It doesn't have to go through the legislature. Um, this accommodation matters, and I have another piece where I argue that this accommodation matters when it has to go through the legislature because the executive, it gives something to the executive branch, right? to wave before the legislature saying, look, okay, we, we defended our interests, we tried, there's this WTO ruling, they provided us some wins on some counts, right? Now we have to change our, our this trade policy, this trade law. Um, so it gives them a little bit of, of added leverage, uh, the executive branch at least, in trying to enact these trade policy reforms. Well, and there. That was terrific, because it, could you just, before we break up, and we are just about up to time, could you say a little bit more about the legal registries? Because I think that's something that most people probably don't know very much about. Yeah, um, what specifically about the legal registries? Well, so, I mean, if we think about courts more generally, like right, courts are given administrative staff. They're given oftentimes um, clerks, right? So we think about clerks to the Supreme Court, and there's actually a lot to Supreme Court justices, and there's actually a lot of interest, new interesting research on the influence that the clerks of the Supreme Court have on on the, the sort of the writing of the actual opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court. So in the same way, when an international judicial institution is set up, they're often given an administrative staff. A big part of their role is just to basically manage, you know, the operation of of the court case of the of the dispute. Um, to ensure that all of some of the written pleadings are handed in on time, that the judges get them to ensure that things run smoothly. Um, they often are the first point of contact between the actual adjudicators and the parties to the dispute. Um, and so in that way, they sort of, they act as this mediator between the disputing members and the judicial actors, right, the, the judges themselves. And in a number of courts, they're given an even greater role, like a legal clerk, right? Um, so I actually, I worked as a legal intern within a war crimes tribunal, and I was tasked with doing all the legal research. I was tasked with effectively drafting a number of the, of the, of the rulings. And so depending on the amount of oversight that the judges have, right, um, on the work of the secretariat, of the register, they're called legal secretariats or registries, it depends on, on the organization, they could actually have a great deal of influence over, over the rulings. Well, this was an absolutely marvelous talk, and uh, thank you very much for giving it. We really appreciate it. Thank you.